Greetings. You are watching the third lecture of the course Introduction to Fourier Analysis. We are in the middle of proving that the complex exponential functions form an orthonormal basis in the space L2 of t, namely the space of two pi periodic functions on Rd, which are square integrable over the box t. The main accomplishment of the previous lecture was to show that the complex exponentials form an orthonormal sequence in the space L2 of t. What remains to be done is to show that the complex exponentials, which we denoted by En, also form a basis. For this purpose, we concluded the previous lecture by stating lemma 1.8. This was a criterion in general Hilbert spaces for verifying that an orthonormal sequence is also an orthonormal basis. In particular, the lemma says that in order to verify that a certain sequence of vectors Ej is an orthonormal basis, it suffices to verify the following condition 5. For every element h in the Hilbert space, if the inner product of h with all of the vectors ej is 0, then h must be the 0 vector. What will happen next is that we verify this condition for the Hilbert space L2 of t and the orthonormal sequence of complex exponentials. Once this has been accomplished, lemma 1.8 immediately implies the following theorem 1.9, which is the central theorem of this lecture. Theorem 1.9 states that the sequence of complex exponentials En is indeed an orthonormal basis in L2 of t. Moreover, every function f in L2 of t has a Fourier series expansion. This means that f can be written as a series n runs in Zd f hat n En. This formula is a direct consequence of part 2 of lemma 1.8, because the Fourier coefficient f hat n equals the inner product of f with the complex exponential en. To be precise, this Fourier series expansion of f converges in the norm of the Hilbert space L2 of t. In other words, the difference of f from its nth partial Fourier series tends to zero in the L2 norm as n tends to infinity. In addition, the following Plancherel identity holds. The L2 norm of f squared equals the sum over n runs in Zd of the absolute value squared of the Fourier coefficients f hat n. Once we have established that the complex exponentials en form an orthonormal basis of L2 of t, the Plancherel identity follows immediately from part 3 of lemma 1.8. Let us also record that part 4 of lemma 1.8 yields the following useful Parseval identity. The bracket of two functions f and g in L2 of t equals a sum over n runs in Zd of the Fourier coefficients f hat n times the complex conjugates of the Fourier coefficients g hat n. The proof of theorem 1.9 will involve the concept of approximate identities, which we will next discuss. Let us fix a sequence of functions psi n, where n ranges in the natural numbers, in C of t. Recall here that C of t stood for the space of two pi periodic continuous functions on Rd. The sequence psi n is called an approximate identity if the following three axioms a1 through to a3 hold. The first axiom a1 states that the average integral of every function psi n has to equal 1. The second axiom, A2, states that the L1 norms of the functions psi n are uniformly bounded. Finally, the axiom A3, roughly speaking, requires that the functions psi n tend uniformly to zero outside the origin. In fact, the requirement of tending uniformly to zero outside the origin is slightly stronger than axiom A3. Axiom A3 only makes this requirement in an average sense. To be precise, fix any positive number delta. Then consider the L1 integral of the functions psi n in the punctured box T where the ball B0 delta has been removed. We require that as n tends to infinity, these integrals tend to zero. From this illustration, we can get a rough idea of how an approximate identity looks like. As the index n grows, the functions psi n get more and more concentrated around the origin. 
but since by axiom A1, the integrals of the functions psi n must remain constant, namely 1, the values of the functions psi n near the origin must grow without any bounds when n tends to infinity. It is not too difficult to find concrete examples of approximate identities. A typical construction is given as follows. Start by fixing any non-negative compactly supported smooth function on Rd whose average integral over the box t equals 1. Then define the sequence psi n by setting psi n of x equals n to the power d phi n of x for n bigger than 1. This sequence is an approximate identity. A common choice for the initial function phi is given by the following formula. Phi of x equals e to the power minus 1 over absolute value of x squared minus 1 when x is less than 1 and 0 when x is bigger than 1. You can check as a fairly tedious exercise that this function is indeed a smooth function on Rd. It follows that the approximate identity generated from this initial function phi consists of smooth functions. The proof of theorem 1.9 also involves approximate identities, but not these usual ones. In fact, the approximate identities required in theorem 1.9 will be constructed as linear combinations of the complex exponential functions. But more on this later. For now, let us discuss why we are interested in approximate identities in the first place. The main reason is lemma 1.11. In this lemma, let psi n be an approximate identity of two biperiodic continuous functions. Then the following two conclusions hold. First, let f be a function in Lp of t, where the exponent p is at least 1 and strictly less than infinity. In this case, the convolutions f convolved with psi n converge to f in the space Lp of t when n tends to infinity. The second conclusion concerns functions f in c of t. In this case, the convolutions f convolved with psi of n converge to f uniformly, or in other words, in the L-infinity norm. Let me warn you that it is not in general true that if f is in L-infinity of t, then the convolutions f convolved with psi of n converge to f in the L-infinity norm. So for this conclusion of L-infinity convergence, you need to assume that f is a continuous 2 pi periodic function. Informally speaking, the motivation for lemma 1.11 is that the functions f convolved with psi of n are typically better behaved than the function f itself. In fact, these functions are usually as well behaved as the functions psi of n. For example, if the psi n functions are c infinity smooth, then the convolutions f convolved with psi of n are also c infinity smooth, assuming, for example, that f is an L1 function. Therefore, the first conclusion of lemma 1.11 tells you that f in Lp can be approximated in the Lp norm by smooth functions. And similarly, the second conclusion of lemma 1.11 tells you that continuous functions can be approximated by smooth functions in the L infinity norm. The proof of lemma 1.11 is rather technical, and it's given on the course Measure and Integration 2. We have now accumulated all the background machinery to start proving theorem 1.9. Recall once more that the main claim of theorem 1.9 is that the complex exponential functions E n form an orthonormal basis in the space L2 of t. To prove this, it suffices by the implication from 5 to 1 in lemma 1.8 to prove the following conclusion. This conclusion is also often known as the uniqueness theorem for Fourier coefficients. If f is a function in L1 of t, and all of the Fourier coefficients of f vanish, then f is the zero function. You might wonder about the appearance of the space L1 of t in this claim, and you are right to wonder. For the proof of theorem 1.9, it would suffice to prove the same claim for all functions f in L2 of t. But this claim has some independent interest, so we will verify it straight away for all functions f in L1 of t. This, of course, implies the claim for all f in L2 of t, because L2 of t is a subset of L1 of t. We will verify this claim first in the case where d, the dimension of the ambient space, is 1. In the end, the case of general dimension can be quite easily reduced to this special case. So now, for the time being, 
let us assume that the dimension d is equal to 1. In this case, the main proof idea is the following. We will begin by constructing an approximate identity of smooth 2 pi periodic functions as finite linear combinations of the complex exponentials. Assume for the time being that we have already found such an approximate identity and let us denote it by psi of n. Since psi of n is a finite linear combination of the complex exponentials, we may write it in the following form. Psi n equals the sum n runs from minus mn to mn, a n times e n, where m n is a natural number and the coefficients a n are complex numbers. Now let us observe that if f is any function in L1 of t, then the convolution f convolved with psi n has an interesting explicit expression. First, using the formula for psi n and the linearity of convolution, f convolved with psi of n equals the sum a n times the convolution of f with e n. Let's stop here for a moment and let us find an explicit expression for the convolution f convolved with e n. By definition, this convolution f convolved with e n evaluated at point x equals the average integral over pi f y times e to the power i n dot x minus y dy. And this formula further simplifies to f hat of n times e n of x. Now if this expression is plugged back into the computation above, we find that f convolved with psi of n equals the sum a n f hat n times e n. But now, if we assume that all of the Fourier coefficients of f vanish identically, we see that f convolved with psi of n is identically the zero function. On the other hand, the functions psi of n form an approximate identity. Recall that this is how the functions psi n were chosen. Consequently, by lemma 1.11, the convolutions f convolved with psi of n approximate the function f in the L1 norm. So, we see the function f can be approximated by the zero function in the L1 norm. It follows that f is the zero function itself, and this is exactly what we claimed. We have now seen that constructing an approximate identity as finite linear combinations of the complex exponentials would be a very powerful tool. But can this be accomplished? Yes, it can, but this is very surprising. To see why, recall how the complex exponentials e n look like. e n of x equals e to the power i n of x, which further equals cosine n of x plus i sine of n x. For the time being, forget completely about the complex term i times sine n of x. Then the real part of the complex exponential e to the power i n of x is simply the cosine function x maps to cosine n of x. Some of these functions for different values of n are illustrated in the figure on the right. These functions take both negative and positive values and they oscillate more and more rapidly as n tends to infinity. On the other hand, a typical approximate identity is depicted in the figure on the left. To me, at least, it seems quite surprising that you can take finite linear combinations of the functions on the right and end up with the functions depicted on the left. In particular, we want these finite linear combinations to be non-negative functions with constant integral equal to 1, and we also want them to vanish, or at least be very small, outside small intervals centered at the origin. These requirements amount to the axioms A1 through to A3 of approximate identities. Fortunately, there is a simple, explicit formula for finding the suitable linear combinations. This formula is known as the nth Feyer kernel Fn. Fn equals 1 over n plus 1, sum m ranges from 0 to big N, sum little n ranges from minus m to m, En. In this double summation, the inner summation is often denoted by dm, and it is known as the Dirichlet kernel. One can compute explicit closed-form expressions for both the Dirichlet and the Feyer kernels. The expression for the Dirichlet kernel looks as follows. dm of x equals sine m plus half x divided by sine half x. You don't need to stare at this formula too much, 
but you should agree that it takes both positive and negative values. In this picture, taken from Wikipedia, you see a depiction of a few of the Dirichlet kernels dm. As you can see from the pictures, the Dirichlet kernels look a little bit like approximate identities, but they take both negative and positive values. In fact, the sequence of Dirichlet kernels does not form an approximate identity. The reason is, quite simply, that the axiom A2 of approximate identities fails for the Dirichlet kernels. The L1 norms of the Dirichlet kernels are not uniformly bounded. One can see this rather easily from the closed form expressions for the Dirichlet kernels, but we leave the precise estimations as an exercise. The reason for introducing the Feyer kernels is precisely that the Dirichlet kernels fail to be an approximate identity. The Feyer kernels, in contrast, do form an approximate identity. Something rather magical happens by averaging over the Dirichlet kernels. One may also find an explicit closed form expression for the Feyer kernels, and it is given as follows. If n of x equals 1 over n plus 1, sine squared n plus 1 over 2x, divided by sine squared half x. In particular, it is evident from this formula that the Feyer kernels are non-negative. In this figure, also taken from Wikipedia, you can see a depiction of a few of the Feyer kernels. Also, the picture verifies what we already saw from the formula, namely that the Feyer kernels are non-negative. In fact, they look very much like the pictures of approximate identities that we saw a bit earlier. Let us verify that the Feyer kernels do indeed form an approximate identity. First of all, since the Feyer kernels are non-negative, their L1 norm equals their integral. This is so because the L1 norm of a function equals the integral of the absolute value of that function. With this in mind, let us compute the integrals of the Feyer kernels. The average integral of f n x dx from minus pi to pi equals, by definition, 1 over n plus 1, sum little n runs from 0 to big N, sum little n runs from minus n to m, average integral of e n x dx. We have already learned and even used before that the average integral of the functions e n x dx equals 0 if n is not 0 and 1 if n is equal to 0. Hence, the only terms in this double summation which survive are the ones where little n is equal to zero. And each of those terms contributes exactly one. Hence, we see that the average integral of the function fn over the interval from minus pi to pi equals one over n plus one, sum n ranges from zero to n, one. And this is equal to one. This computation shows that both the integrals and the L1 norms of the functions fn are equal to 1. This verifies both axioms a1 and a2 of approximate identities at the same time. So it remains to verify axiom a3. This axiom required that the functions fn should tend uniformly to zero outside any fixed neighborhood of the origin. To see this, it is easiest to refer to the explicit closed form expressions for the functions fn. Fix any positive number delta and fix a point x on the interval from minus pi to pi, but outside the interval from minus delta to delta. Consider the closed form expression for fn of x evaluated at such a point x. Turn your attention to the denominator of this expression, namely sine squared half of x. Notice that when x is in the interval from minus pi to pi, but not on the interval from minus delta to delta, there is a uniform lower bound for this denominator. In other words, the denominator stays bounded away from zero. Because also the numerator of the expression, namely sine squared n plus 1 divided by 2x, is uniformly bounded by 1, we see that the whole expression is bounded by some constant depending on delta times 1 over n plus 1. And of course, this upper bound tends to zero as n tends to infinity. Hence, we have argued that the functions fn tend uniformly to zero outside the interval of minus delta to delta, and this is exactly what axiom A3 required. So, we have now concluded the proof that the Feyer kernels fn form an approximate identity.
With this information in hand, we may conclude from lemma 1.11 that the convolutions f convolved with big F of n converge to f in the LP norm whenever f is an LP function and p is strictly less than infinity. In particular, this is true when f is an L1 function. From this point on, the proof of the theorem in the case when d is equal to 1 can be concluded exactly as we have seen before. Fix an L1 function f so that all of the Fourier coefficients of f vanish. Then consider the convolution of f with the Feyer kernel fn. This convolution, evaluated at the point x, can be written as follows. f convolved with fn at x equals 1 over n plus 1, sum little n runs from 0 to big n, sum little n runs from minus m to m, f convolved with en x. Further, as we already saw earlier, the convolution of f with the function en evaluated at the point x equals f hat of n times e to the power i n x. Now, since the Fourier coefficients f hat n are assumed to vanish identically, we may conclude that the convolution of f with the Feyer kernel f n vanishes identically. Now, it follows from lemma 1.11 that f is the limit in L1 of the convolutions of f with the Feyer kernels, and since all of these convolutions are identically the zero function, also f must be the zero function. This is precisely what we claimed, and the proof of theorem 1.9 is complete in the case d is equal to 1. We promised earlier that the higher dimensional case can be easily reduced to the one dimensional case. We will now see the details, but only for the case d is equal to 2 to avoid notational complications. The claim looks exactly the same as before. We fix a function f in L1 of the box minus pi pi squared. And we assume that all of the Fourier coefficients f hat n vanish for all n in z squared. The claim is then that f is the zero function. To prove this, we introduce a family of auxiliary functions in one variable. These functions are denoted by gm, where m is an integer. The precise definition of the function gm is as follows. gm of x equals the average integral from minus pi to pi f x y e to the power minus i my dy. We record that if m is a fixed integer, then gm is in L1 of minus pi to pi. Indeed, as the following simple estimate using the triangle inequality shows, the L1 norm of gm is bounded by the L1 norm of f. Furthermore, we can compute that the Fourier coefficient of gm with index n equals the Fourier coefficient of f with indices m and n. Since all of the Fourier coefficients of f are assumed to vanish, it follows that all of the Fourier coefficients of gm are also zero. Therefore, gm is a 2 pi periodic L1 function on the interval from minus pi to pi, all of whose Fourier coefficients are zero. It then follows from the one-dimensional result we proved earlier, that gm is the zero function for all integers m. Let's spell out explicitly what this means. Fix once again an integer m, and note that gm of x equals the average integral from minus pi to pi f x y e to the power minus i m y d y. We have just argued that this expression vanishes for almost all x in R. Now consider the function f sub index x defined by f sub index x y equals to f x y. Then the formula which we just acquired states that for almost all x in R, all of the Fourier coefficients of the function f x are zero. Now, for almost all x in R, the function f sub-index x is yet another 2 pi periodic L1 function. And we have just argued that all of its Fourier coefficients vanish. Hence, by one more application of the one-dimensional result, we conclude that f sub-index x is the zero function for almost all x in R. If you unwrap the definitions of the functions f sub-index x, this implies that f vanishes almost surely.
This concludes the proof of the theorem in the case d is equal to 2. The higher dimensional cases can be treated in the same way as the case d is equal to 2, and they are left as a voluntary exercise. The proof of theorem 1.9 is now complete. Before the end of the lecture, I would like to draw your attention to one more thing. During the proof of theorem 1.9, we established the following uniqueness theorem. Let f be a function in L1 of t and assume that all of the Fourier coefficients of f vanish. Then f is zero almost everywhere. This concludes the third lecture on the course Introduction to Fourier.